Hello, this is Angela, one of the hosts of Journeys of Hope, and I'm standing here on the grounds of Pilgrim Center of Hope. Guiding people on Journeys of Hope is our passion, and as a nonprofit organization, we couldn't do it without you. Today, I'd like to thank our generous sponsor who made this podcast possible in honor of Valentin, Nicholas, and Francisco Campos. Journeys of Hope, an introduction to the universal church that promotes an attitude of pilgrimage among the faithful by introducing you to pilgrim destinations around the world. Welcome to Journeys of Hope, your passport to sacred destinations around the world. Each program produced by Pilgrim Center of Hope provides you with a virtual pilgrimage to many of the places associated with the history of our church and written about in Scripture. Since 1993, Pilgrim Center of Hope has led over 70 authentic spiritual pilgrimages to the Holy Land, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Germany, marrying apparition sites, and beyond. As a result, Journeys of Hope is able to take you to all these holy sites so that you can experience what it is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, the Apostles, and the Saints. Additionally, we also like to take you on local pilgrimages to sacred destinations that played a major role in the establishment of the Catholic Church in the San Antonio area. I'm Robert Rodriguez, PR and Marketing Staff Person at Pilgrim Center of Hope. I also serve as the coordinator for our Catholic Men's Conference. And I'm Deacon Tom Fox co-founder and co-director of the Pilgrim Center of Hope. Thanks for being with us. Journeys of Hope is a co-production of Pilgrim Center of Hope on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Our programs are available on podcasts and also at our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. If you're new to our program, I encourage you to take a look at our Journeys of Hope archive, which contains all the previous episodes of the show. This week, we are journeying to Cana of Galilee, which lies on the way between Nazareth and the Sea of Galilee. The Gospel of John places the first of the signs performed by Jesus in the locality of Cana, the changing of water into wine during a marriage celebration. In the same village, Jesus performs his second miracle from a distance when he cures the servant of a Roman centurion. And as we get further into the program, we will take a closer look at the related passages of Scripture from the Gospel of John. Now, Deacon Tom, you have been to the Holy Land and to Cana between 50 and 60 times. Mm. I only recently made my first pilgrimage as part of one of our groups. Because of my love of our Blessed Mother and St. John the Evangelist, I thoroughly enjoyed being at the actual site where Mary told the servants at the wedding to do whatever he tells you. This is one of the many holy sites under the care of the Franciscan custody of the Holy Land. These are Franciscan friars who have been caring for many of these sites for over 800 years. It's also worth noting at this time that back in the 17th century, the Vatican officially recognized and confirmed Kafir Cana as Cana of Galilee, where the wedding feast and changing of water into wine took place. Built over the traditional site of the miracle of the wine is a Catholic church known as the Wedding Church, built by the Franciscans uh, at the end of the 19th century. You approach the Wedding Church from across a courtyard. The church has a modest facade flanked by twin bell towers and adorned with angel statues. It is in this church where it has become a tradition among Christian and Catholic pilgrims to renew their wedding vows. Uh, From our group, we had over a dozen couples who took part in such a ceremony and and something very memorable for all of them. Also below the wedding church is a small museum displaying excavated artifacts, including an ancient stone jar encased in thick plexiglass. It is believed to be similar to one of the six jars which contained the water that was turned into wine by Jesus. Remember, each of the jars held about 23 gallons. The stone jars that the Lord uses to convert the water into wine are extremely heavy and enormous. They cannot be easily moved. The Jews considered stone purer than pottery, therefore they were used for important sacred rituals such as Jewish ceremonial washings. That our Lord would use these jars makes perfect sense. 
that he would use them for a wedding at Cana makes even more sense. In ancient Palestine, in the time of Christ, a wedding might start at twilight, and the wedding feast uh, typically lasted a few days, even up to a, a, a week, perhaps even longer, uh, which explains why there could have been a need uh, for much more wine. As to how Jesus ended up at this particular wedding celebration, it is believed that the Virgin Mary was a close friend of the bridegroom's family. In the Gospel of John, chapter 2, it states that the mother of Jesus was there, and then it goes on to say, Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. Of course, this wedding is a part of God's providence. It's a perfect setting for Jesus to reveal his glory and begin his public ministry, and it is the perfect time for Mary to reveal her role as intercessor. This is a quote from St. Alphonsus in one of his Sunday sermons. Quote, To understand Mary's goodness, let us remember what the gospel says. There was a shortage of wine, which naturally worried the married couple. No one asked the Blessed Virgin to intervene and request her son to come to the rescue of the couple. But Mary's heart cannot but take pity on the unfortunate couple. It stirs her to act as an intercessor and ask her son for the miracle, even though no one asked her to do so. If Our Lady acts like this without being asked, what would she have done if they actually asked her to intervene?" Unquote. And then, of course, even though Jesus says it's not his time, Mary puts her total trust in him, knowing that whatever he does will be the right thing. And she tells the stewards, do whatever he tells you. And here we see the importance of trust and obedience. Uh, quote, John did this at the beginning of his signs in, Cal in Cana and Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him, unquote. So this was such a significant uh, miracle that it, uh, it impressed the disciples uh, so much to see that Jesus had this divine power. Jesus come to this wedding not long after his baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist and his 40 days in, in the desert. The changing of the water into wine is symbolic on many levels. In our second segment, we'll focus more on how the wedding to Cana prefigures the Eucharist. The water of purification made way for the wine, which becomes the blood of salvation in the Holy Mass. The wedding feast of Cana scriptures there, uh, there points out several realities. First, it's the earliest use of the term disciples in the ministry of Jesus. The disciples believed to be present were Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, and John and his brother James. And then also Nathaniel, whose uh, Greek name was Bartholomew, was from Cana. So in many ways, uh, Jesus performing his first miracle at the wedding at Cana can be seen as symbolic of him uh, setting his seal on the sanctity of marriage. God himself is the author of marriage. The vocation to marriage is written in the very nature of man and woman as they come from the hand of the Creator. Marriage is not a purely human institution, despite the many variations it may have undergone through the centuries in different cultures, social structures, and spiritual attitudes. Yeah, of course, that's one of the uh, quotes from the Catholic Catechism, and there's a, another one that's, that's relevant, uh, quote, God, who created man out of love, also calls him to love, the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. For man is created in the image and likeness of God, who himself is love. Since God created man and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves man. And this love, which God blesses, is intended to be fruitful and to be realized in the common work of watching over creation. A quote, God, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. From Genesis. It is significant that Jesus performs his first miracle during a marriage, the institution which is fundamental to the continuation of the human race. It is also significant that Jesus provides a superabundance of the best wine during his first miracle, and, and we'll be talking more about this later. So you have, uh, being that we have a little bit of uh, extra time during this first segment, 
you had brought some other material with you in relation to uh, just helping couples in their marriage that maybe we should could share before we get into Scripture in the second half of the program. Yeah, this is uh, my wife, Mary Jane, and I. As a matter of fact, well, Mary Jane would normally be here. Exactly. She, uh, I guess most people are aware that she had this accident in, in the Holy Land and, and broke her, her ankle. She was in therapy uh, today, and uh, it's going to be a while uh, before she returns to normal. But anyway, Mary Jane and I, uh, on a number of occasions, have presented uh, some points for young couples that are, are about to enter into marriage, because marriage is certainly is so significant in God's plan for the, continu- for the continuation, not only of the human race, but even for the continuation of the kingdom of God. Because in, in holy matrimony, the man and the woman both become one in Christ. It's like they become a new creation in their relationship with each other and with God. What a, what a powerful uh, symbol. And as powerful as that is, yet we can succumb to our human weaknesses. And we know that uh, the state of marriage, in, not only in this country, but in so many countries, has really uh, been attacked. Uh, such a high rate of divorce and how that impacts the family, the negative impact. So we, we have some points that we put together um, to help people to uh, strengthen their marriage and to look at some possibilities that perhaps they, they could overlook. And first of all, that husband and wife should, should pray together every day. Um, their relationship will never grow spiritually if they don't pray together. And then have a religious symbols in your home, a crucifix. Have a, a candle where you, uh, to light when you come together in, in, in prayer. Uh, and throw in your home to the sacred heart of Jesus. Have your home blessed occasionally with a, by a, a deacon or, or a priest, your, your, your pastor. And, and maybe invite them uh, for, a, uh, for a meal. Uh, you know, join, coming together in, in a, um, for a meal is really it strengthens relationships. Um, have sacred space for your uh, prayer. Maybe a corner in a particular room that uh, you have a, a comfortable chair, you have your images, you have your Bible, maybe uh, some spiritual reading where it helps you to enter into prayer. And then, of course, simply pray before meals, um, especially when you're in public because it becomes a sign that you are proud of your, your Christian faith and it may be an inspiration for others also to pray before their meal. Uh, pray the rosary together. Uh, if not every day, at least once a week. That rosary is a, is a powerful prayer and, and Mary really wants to strengthen marriages. And then every week, have the family come together for a few moments of, of communication. Maybe even try uh, a, few, a, a few minutes of silence just uh, inviting God to be present in, in your family. And then, uh, of course, to read the scriptures uh, together, uh, even just for a few moments. Um, bless your children before they leave the home, uh, or even bless each other when you're go- if you're both going off to work or if one or the other is going off to work. Have holy words together before you go your, your separate ways. And, and then, of course, even when you get in, in your car, say, say a prayer. So there's many things we can do that can help to strengthen our marriage and, and to bring our, our life back into focus of, you know, why, why we are really here. We're, we're not just an accident. We're, we're here by God's design, and we need to invite God into the routine. You know, uh, as you're talking about that, it's unfortunate that so many people, yes, people remember and know that marriage is a sacrament, but they forget that it's also a vocation yeah. and, and a way, again, of, yes, uh, that involves our Lord that involves the faith and that involves, of course, passing that along to, to the children in the household. It's the most, really, you know, when we pray for vocations, marriage is the first vocation. It's the most important vocation, I, I think we can say. It's because it's the, the vocation where uh, that's essential to the church. It's the vocation because the church can't exist without families. And families uh, is, the, is supposed to be the environment where other vocations are discovered. Um, 
if we would really listen to the prayers during baptism and the uh, the challenges to the uh, to the parents and the godparents, you know, the, the parents and the godparents are supposed to be the first teachers of the faith and and to confirm that faith for the children as they continue to grow, so that as the children grow, they know without a doubt that God loves them and that God has a plan for them and then that they are, to discover that plan prayer is essential so yes the, the sacrament of marriage what a beautiful part of God's plan for humanity and it, it is so easy can be m- missed if we don't make the effort to discover the the truth of that sacrament you know one of our recent meet the master gatherings which we have monthly on uh, Saturdays, and which will continue in 2020, uh, we talked about, uh, when talking about prayer and asking our Lord to teach us how to pray, that uh, it is the parents who really need to model mm-hmm. that. And uh, basically, if, if the children are seeing that from their parents, that then that, that is something they'll know to continue with and pick up with in their life, but that it really has to be demonstrated to them by their mother and father, and even the, the catechism talks about uh, the importance of that. Yes, and what, what a beautiful thing for, uh, for children to see their parents praying together. It gives them a sense of security, and that the parents um, ex- exhibit their love for each other in front of the children to uh, again to give the children that security as they're as they're growing up, it, it, it's sad. There's so many young people that uh, that come from broken homes that miss that whole security that that is should be should be there for for their development. There's a s- statistic that I think is something like less than uh, thirty or forty percent of children are going to live with both biological parents until they reach age 18. Well, you know, what, what an impact that has on the, on the family, on the, upon the culture, and, and upon the church. We, we, there needs to be so much uh, prayer for, for families. And, and, of course, I know there's a lot of ministries that uh, that, that is their focus. But... It, we don't have to have a, a ministry to tell us what to do. We, we, we should know naturally as a, a husband and wife that we need to pray together and bring God into the center of our relationship. Uh, even people that, that aren't Christian, that they, they need to know that there's a, a, a higher power uh, that they need to look to. Be, uh, otherwise, where do, you, where do you find hope if, you, if you're only... If your only hope is what you experience um, uh, in your in your environment without any uh, influence from from church or or about God, gosh, what what a difficult existence that would be. I totally agree, and uh, hopefully, everyone who's listening is uh, not only uh, you know we're, we've taken them to Cana, but they, mm-hmm. for the purpose, too, of underscoring the importance of the sacrament of marriage, looking at it as a vocation, and uh, the steps they can take to strengthen that marriage and to honor God uh, in, in their marriage. And I think when anybody thinks about Cana that, that's familiar with the scripture, they immediately think about marriage, I mean, because that was the focal point. Uh, actually, the marriage ceremony in, in that scripture is more important than Cana because it's all about the, the marriage ceremony and what happens there. <laughs> yes, most definitely. And as we talk about that, and you certainly had a chance to witness this, uh, because for the one time that I saw it, I know how powerful it was and meaningful for those couples who were there to mm-hmm. re- renew their vows in that in yeah. that place, in that in that exact spot. Yes, it's, it's emotional. I, I mean. Uh, as we, Mary Jane and I, have renewed our vows at least forty times there <laughs> in Cana, but um, and people have been married for forty, fifty years. Uh, tears come to their eyes to hear those words again in, the, uh, in this holy setting. Those holy words, those words of the uh, of matrimony and and the the significance of that, 
And then maybe for many people, of all the years that have passed since making their vows, how, you know, they've, they've been through difficult times and they've been through joys and so forth. But now to once again, and all these years later, to, uh, to renew that, that commitment is very, uh, very beautiful and, and, and moving. Well, in the same village of Cana of Galilee, Jesus performed his second miracle, and he did this miracle from a distance. And this is the story of when he cures the servant of the Roman centurion. So this is from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. Then he returned to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. Now there was a royal official whose son was ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son who was near death. Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, You may go. Your son will live. The man believed what Jesus said to him and left. While he was on his way back, his slaves met him and told him that his boy would live. He asked them when he began to recover. They told him the fever left him yesterday about one in the afternoon. The father realized that just at that time, Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he and his whole household came to believe. This was the second sign Jesus did when he came to Galilee from Judea. Yes, a powerful story of, uh, of healing. And, and of course, uh, Jesus, and, you know, uh, with this story and, and with others where he makes a point of the faith of, uh, of the key person in, in the gospel, in this case, the, what we believe to be is a centurion, always called a, a royal a, a official, because there's, in other gospels, there's a, a similar story in which the, the person named is a centurion. But here, um, Jesus kind of sets the setting when, when, he, when he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Well, this man hadn't really seen any signs and wonders. He had just heard um, uh, about Jesus, and he just believed that Jesus would do something for him. And when Jesus says, okay, go, it's, it's done, the man didn't say, well, now, wait a minute, when you come with me, I want to see, I want to see you do this. No, he, he just totally, he totally uh, uh, believed. And this kind of, you know, there's, there's other scriptures in which uh, Jesus is uh, amazed at, at the faith of individuals. Of, for, for instance, the Samaritan woman, uh, you know, the woman at the well, who uh, is the wonderful dialogue that Jesus had with her, and, and which she becomes, a, she starts out uh, uh, as a, someone that's not religious, somebody that's even living uh, in, in sin, I, I would suppose, since she was, the man she was living with was not her husband. Uh, right, and that, and that Jesus was able to tell her that, <laughs> yeah. and know that, yeah. And, and that didn't scare her off, and, but she saw something in, in Jesus, and as the more they talked, she recognized uh, who Jesus was, and then she went off and told the whole town, and, and the people said, well, we no longer need you to tell us. We believe. We also believe. So there's the Samaritan woman, uh, the grateful leper. We know that uh, Jesus kill, cured 10 lepers, but one, one came back. What was it that made him be different than the other nine that were, that were cured? And then, of course, the good thief, two men crucified with, um, with, with Jesus, uh, the one expecting Jesus said, okay, if you, if you are the son of God, uh, free yourself and us too. Or the other one, the other one, the one that we call the good thief, just recognized in Jesus uh, his hope for eternal life and said, Lord, let, uh, and Jesus said, you will be with me in, in the kingdom. So what separated these people the ones uh, that, ha that had such spontaneous faith uh, from others, even the religious leaders that, that uh, didn't believe in Jesus. Well, it was, it, perhaps it was their expectations. 
because they knew that a Messiah was coming, they already had uh, their idea of what the Messiah should look like. They expected him to be a political leader that would free them from oppression or from whatever it was that made their life difficult. Jesus was, was not that Messiah. Jesus was a Messiah that is to help us unite ourselves with our Heavenly Father in, in, in mercy and in love. And, and not a, through a set of, um, uh, of laws that um, could be abused. The laws were good. And, and Jesus said, I've not, I've not come to, uh, to change the law, to, but to fulfill it. So the law in itself was good, but it was being abused. So anyway, you, expectations. And, and you bring up uh, something at which, uh, as you were talking, it made me think about uh, the differences of how uh, Jesus was perceived prior to the start of his public ministry and, yeah. and after, and also how, for instance, the people of Nazareth, because they had seen him grow up and yeah. seen him around Joseph and her blessed mother, that they couldn't uh, somehow, because they knew of that right. life, they couldn't see him beyond being right. the son of Joseph and Mary. And how could the son of Joseph and Mary be the son right. of God? And how could he do all these things? Yeah. And consequently, uh, what, no miracles occur in Nazareth. In Nazareth. Right. But yet, take, for instance, in Capernaum, which becomes his home uh, during his public ministry, and how many miracles occurred and how, as you just described, people... Uh, were more able to believe yeah. and have faith. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And, and I think the, a point for us is expectations, not only with, you know, how do we expect God uh, to work in our lives, but what are our expectations of uh, uh, people we share our life with, or, or even just anybody in, in general we can damage relationships with by having wrong expectations. So I think expectations is a is an important an important word, and that that needs to be uh, redeemed maybe because we we should have expectations of eternal life. We should have expectations that in the midst of my dilemma, my suffering, whatever it is, the most negative thing in my life, my expectation is that Jesus will be there with me and give me the grace to move through it. Even if I don't receive a miraculous cure, I will receive what I need to be sustained. Jesus will, will always be with us. So that is an expectation that we should enjoy. But we, but we have to be careful is to say, uh, to have an expectation uh, that maybe is beyond reality. And, and when that expectation doesn't happen, then it, it causes, causes us to move into neg negativity, you know. Uh, so anyway, we, expectations are good. We just need, we need to uh, uh, sanctify them. <laughs> exactly, yes. Well, you know, as part of Journeys of Hope, uh, we regularly like to draw on the wisdom of the church, our popes, mm -hmm. and also our saints. Uh, so in preparation for today's program, uh, the research led to uh, some beautiful ways to look at uh, the wedding at Cana. And one of those comes to us from St. Jose Maria Escriva, who offers a wonderful perspective. Uh, and here is what St. Jose Maria wrote in uh, Christ is Passing By, and this is number 141. The gospel passages about Our Lady show her as the mother of Jesus, following her son step by step, playing a part in his redemptive mission, rejoicing and suffering with him, loving those whom Jesus loves, looking after all those around her with maternal care. Just think, for example, of the marriage at Cana. Our lady was a guest at one of those noisy country weddings attended by crowds of people from many different villages. But she was the only one who noticed the wine was running out. Don't these scenes from Christ's life seem familiar to us? The greatness of God lives at the level of ordinary things. It is natural for a woman, a housewife, to notice something was lacking, to look after the little things which make life pleasant. And that is how Mary acted. 
Notice also that it is John who tells the story of Cana. He is the only evangelist who has recorded this example of our mother's concern for us. St. John wants us to remember that Mary was present at the beginning of the public life of our Lord. He alone has appreciated the importance of that fact. Jesus knew to whom he was entrusting his mother, to a disciple who had learned to understand and love her as his own mother. And uh, just a, a few more uh, focal points. I think there's, there's especially three main points that are relative to uh, the wedding feast of Cana. The first, of course, is obvious that Jesus reveals his divinity and that his disciples come to believe in him, as the scripture says, and his public ministry begins. Also, as I said before, we see the power of Mary's intercession. Even though Jesus said it was not yet his time, he fulfills his mother's request. And third, something that we also had talked about a little bit is Christ's presence at the wedding is a sign that he blesses the love between man and woman joined in marriage. God instituted marriage at the beginning of creation. Uh, that's in, in Genesis chapters, chapter 1, verses 27 through 28. Jesus confirmed it and raised it to the dignity of a sacrament. Quote, God created man in his own image. In the divine image, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. That's uh, from the Gospel of, of Matthew and the commentary from the Navari Bible. In the sacrament of matrimony, the man and woman become one in Christ, and the relationship is forever changed. They have entered into a supernatural relationship with each other and with God, and with both spouses love God more than each other. God, who is the source of love and of all that is good, will increase their love for each other. He will give them the grace to love and serve each other, even in the most difficult of times. Marriage is the most important institution in the history of the world. When marriages are strong and healthy, the culture is strong and healthy. However, when marriages are not strong, we see the consequence in our society. The growing divorce rate has fractured families, and less than 40% of children in this country will live with both biological parents until they reach the age of 18. In most cases, there's very little prayer in families, and if they don't pray, their decisions will not be guided by faith. The most important vocation in the church and in the world is holy marriages because they are the source of other vocations, and as marriage goes, so goes the church and our country. I don't know why I'm thinking about this now, but uh, this makes me think of uh, the family of St. Therese oh, yes. of Lisieux oh, yeah. and how, you know, especially more recently in recent years that her parents were also made saints, mm -hmm. uh, that how demonstrating the love for our Lord, love for each other uh, can influence an entire family uh, right. when you look at how all but one daughter uh, became a Carmelite nun, and then one of them, uh, of course, being St. Therese, uh, just what that can be like. And we all know families like that, you know, that everybody, uh, when you're at Sunday Mass, that that one or two family comes in, you know, the husband, the wife, the five kids, and, and just how beautiful it is. Yeah, well, I think all the daughters became Carmelites except for one. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, exactly. But that is God's design, not that every member of the family become a, a clergy or, or religious, but it's that every member of the family be confident that God has a plan for them and that God will help them discover that plan in prayer, living the sacramental life, reading the scriptures, all those things that have been the way that people, saints have lived through the ages. That's the same plan for us. We just have to employ it. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you know, when I've, whether it's, uh, people in my own family, siblings or uh, relatives, where you can see how uh, those virtues and values and faith has been passed on and consequently how, you know, the next generations demonstrate that and in, in how they uh, treat each other, how they treat other people, how they serve uh, the community and, and are so, again, practicing those virtues and with solid character. Uh, and, and and that's true. And then at the same time, sometimes parents can do everything right. And and because of the powerful influence of the culture, 
that the uh, the, the child can go off in, in another direction with no fault of the of the parents. Them that can also be a, a reality. But that's where we have to recognize that we are in the, in the midst of a warfare, and, and we if we want to. Uh, uh, win the battle and and, and the war, uh, then we need to employ the uh, the weapons that the Lord has given us, and, and of course that's the uh, the mass, the sacraments, the rosary, the scriptures. We have what we need. We we just need to uh, use those weapons more so, yes, yeah. than ever before. Right. Definitely. Well, let me refer to another eye-opening account related to the symbolism of the wedding at Cana. This one comes to us from St. Augustine, who wrote the following in his Tractates on the Gospel of John, number 8.4.1 through 3. The Lord was invited and came to a wedding. Is it any wonder that he who came to that house for a wedding came to this world for a wedding? Therefore, he has a bride here whom he has redeemed by his blood and to whom he has given the Holy Spirit as a pledge. He wrested her from enslavement to evil. He died for her sins. He arose again for her justification. Who will offer such great things to his bride? Men may offer some trinket or other form, uh, other things from the earth, such as gold, silver, precious stones, horses, slaves, farms, or estates. Will any offer his blood? For if he gives his blood to his bride, he will not be alive to take her as his wife. But the Lord, dying free of anxiety, gave his blood for her in order that when he arose, he might have her whom he had already joined to himself in the womb of the virgin. For the word was the bridegroom and human flesh was the bride. And yes, and of course, we see, a, you know, the symbolism of it. In, uh, in the scriptures, especially in Corinthians, of the of that's often read at at, at weddings of you know what uh, what that married life uh, looks like, and and of course the, the church has always said that uh, the relationship between a man and woman in holy matrimony should reflect the relationship between Jesus Christ and His church, because the uh, the church is uh, is the bride of is the bride of Christ, and here are some words from Pope Francis about the wedding at Cana. By changing the water for ritual purification into wine, Jesus signals that he is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Mary's command to the servants, "Do whatever he tells you," can serve as a program of life for the church. We are constantly to renew our love for the Lord and to draw new wine new life from his saving wounds. The miracle at Cana reminds us that we are invited as members of the Lord's family, the church, to draw near to him in faith and thus to share in the joy of the wedding feast of the new and eternal covenant and um, to share in that wedding feast every day. Uh, and, and, And that's one of the beautiful things as Catholics that we have the opportunity to attend a holy mass Every day, the banquet of the of the body and blood of Jesus yes. Christ. You know what? Uh, how uh, there is no, there's nothing we can do on this earth to have greater intimacy with Jesus Christ than to attend the Holy Mass and to receive He, uh, he Himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity in in uh, the Holy Eucharist. So as we talk about that, our our church our parish, um, and we've just talked about uh, Cain of Galilee, the place, and uh, what occurred there. Uh, there's something to be said for not only going to your parish to celebrate Mass, but, uh, you know, we, we're all pilgrims mm, uh, yes. journeying together yeah. every day. And, of mm. course, when we go to the Holy Land or go to different holy sites around the world, it's, it's actually physically making... Uh, an authentic spiritual journey, but it's necessary for all of us to do, and you don't have to. I mean, if you can make that trip, right, Mm -hmm. uh, that's fantastic and ideal, but uh, there are ways to make a pilgrimage even right here at home and and, and to make things new again. Yes. Uh, And, you know, the the church has used that term for centuries, that we are 
of pilgrim people. We're all on, on a journey, and we should not be uh, too attached to our routine, uh, that we're afraid to break out of that routine to, dis to move into discovery of something, uh, something new. And that's what, pilgrimage is, uh, that's what pilgrimage have the possibility of doing. Uh, that's why we at the Pilgrim Center of Hope, we really f uh, focus on having a spiritual pilgrimage and we're not just a religious tour that is a, a picture-taking experience, uh, you know, and uh, so forth. But no, it's to enter into the mysteries of our faith. And um, before John Paul II, uh, as he was preparing the church for the year 2000, one of the things that he wanted to reintroduce was this whole thing of being, of going on pilgrimage because it's such a beautiful thing, a, a way of building up the body of Christ. It not only uh, affects the people that go on the, the pilgrimage and have the experience, but it, it affects the whole body of Christ. It's a good thing uh, for, for the church, uh, for the graces that the Lord pours out uh, during that time. So he talked specifically um, about pilgrimages to Rome, uh, and especially the five major basilicas in Rome, and the Holy Land uh, to visit, the, uh, of course, uh, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the, the Church of the Nativity, the, uh, and the Nazareth, Tabor, all of the, one, all of the significant churches there in, in the Holy Land. But he said, also, you can make a pilgrimage to your local cathedral, or to the uh, Little Flower Basilica, Basilica. you yes. know, that's a beautiful, and the, the, the friars, missions. Yeah, yes, uh, um, we have, especially in San Antonio, uh, so many spiritual resources that we, uh, that we take for granted, but even you can make, uh, you can make a pilgrimage to your own parish, perhaps make the effort to visit as if you are visiting it the first time. Maybe notice things you never noticed before. We can, it's easy to fall into a routine where we do, you know, we go into church, we sit in the same place, and uh, hopefully we are deeply involved in the, uh, in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But even the beautiful Mass itself could become routine if we are, are not, if we don't employ our, our will and, and our... Uh, um, our intelligence to, to be present to, to truly what's happening. But you can enter into your church, look around, see, the, you know, the, there's statuary there the, that's for a, for a purpose, uh, stained glass windows, uh, hopefully, the, you know, the, the, uh, the tabernacle, the holy presence of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's so much, you know, especially in the older churches, uh, in, in Europe and even in uh, the United States, uh, not so much in the United States, more so in Europe, they were built uh, uh, with the, the stained glass, the statuary, and, and the environment in itself was to teach you about the faith. If you couldn't read or write, by entering into the church, you could learn about God's plan of salvation just by looking at you know at the windows and right and, uh, that and they the told the story nativity. yes yes yes, yes. So, so so beautiful so uh, anyway there's so many ways that we can be drawn out of our routine uh, to make our faith more alive and so we encourage you to think about pilgrimage uh, it's especially if you have the means uh, to go to the Holy Land, there's nothing like it in, in, in the whole world, of course, because that's where uh, our salvation was won for us. That's where God w walked the earth and, and where uh, Jesus Christ especially told us of how much God loves us and then uh, witnessed that love by the, the way by the way he lived, by by his miracles, by his teaching, and then, of course, by his passion, death, and, and resurrection. So there's nothing, to go to the, the Holy Land is life-changing, but also so many other places, too, you know, in uh, Rome, uh, throughout Italy, and Spain, and every country, I believe every country has its own pilgrimage destinations, even you know, the Immaculate Conception Cathedral in, in uh, Washington, uh, D.C. is a beautiful uh, destination place. Of course, in Mexico, uh, 
the missions here in San Antonio and in California and and anyway, all our, every place has its destinations. And you know, as as you bring that up, it's an opportunity to remind people because we said at the top of the show, not only do we visit holy sites uh, where Jesus walked, where Blessed Mother and the Apostles walked, but we do our local uh, journeys of hope and take your own pilgrimage, uh, yes, to places here that we may have looked at in one way, but through these programs, we attempt to explain it all. And not only that, yes, the significance of the patron saint of a particular parish or in the case of the missions talking about the life of St. Francis and the Franciscans. But yes, I encourage our listeners to go to our uh, archive. We have all of those old programs. We've, We've had people actually visit Pilgrim Center of Hope and say that when they took relatives visiting San Antonio to the missions, they used our recordings about the missions and were able to show the missions in a, a completely different way because now they were getting the the spiritual history and uh, able to tie it to their everyday lives by way of learning more, uh, be it about the saints connected, uh, the Basilica a great example that you, if you go and really study it, you can learn about the life of St. Teresa of Avila, of St. John of the Cross, and of course of St. Therese. And uh, you begin to learn about uh, why, for instance, they are all doctors of the church. Uh, You learn about uh, the whole idea of reflective and meditative prayer, contemplative prayer, you learn through the stained glass windows about what both of them went through to reform the Carmelites and, and about uh, their famous writings. So there's there's so much more there. And if you take that time, perhaps to go outside of mass, uh, to just spend a little time just, uh, yes, uh, taking it in and uh, letting it speak to you. Yeah. And, you know, another beauty of our Catholic faith is our liturgy is a, is a pilgrimage through the year. You know, we have all the liturgical seasons. Uh, uh, again, going back to the Holy Land, I mean, you, you, can, you can experience a, a significant portion of the liturgical year in two weeks. But, you know, because you, uh, even if you're in the Holy Land in July, you celebrate Christmas in Bethlehem. You celebrate, the, you know, the resurrection in the, the, uh, the Holy Sepulchre Church. And, you know, the different um, uh, destinations of, of his passion. And uh, just if we really are in tune with the life of the church, it is a, it's a journey of faith. So we certainly uh, want to thank everyone for being with us for this journey. And uh, as has been our tradition with every program, we always like to leave our listeners with a jewel for the journey. So in this case, um, this one comes to us from uh, St. Pope John Paul II, uh, who tells us that marriage is an act of will that signifies and involves a mutual gift which unites the spouses and binds them to their eventual souls with whom they make up a soul family, a domestic church. Mm. So that's another interesting thing. few words there, a domestic church, and yes. drawing that connection to marriage. Yeah, and everything we've been talking about is it all begins with an act of the will. Uh, you know, God cannot be outdone in humility. Can you imagine? It's a mystery in itself that Almighty God would become human just to convince us that he loves us and then to save us. It, it, it's, a, it's truly a mystery in, in itself, but that he wants that mystery to move us closer to him. And there is, there is not one person living on this earth who God is not interested in. There's not one person, no matter, uh, no matter what we have done, the worst possible thing you can imagine, there's no person that the Lord will not forgive. There's no person that the Lord does not want to have intimacy with, but it, it will only it will only happen if we let it happen. If if our desire is to get close to God, then we say, God, help me help me find the way. And then after we would make that prayer, 
to be open to the ways that God wants to break into our life. And there's so many saints that have that story. And there, there's uh, uh, people in broken lives that reached the bottom and said, God, if you're real, show me. And God will if we are true, if, if we have a contrite, humble heart. God can work in a contrite, humble heart. So I guess that would be part of our, our, our hope for m- myself and for everybody I love and for everybody that's listening is that we would always have a humble, contrite heart that will allow uh, God to influence and inspire us and guide us uh, to our destination. We need to let him in, for yeah. sure, most definitely. Uh, it's now time for us to close today's program with a closing prayer. Deacon Tom, if you will lead us yeah. in that prayer, okay. please. We thank you, O oh God, for the love you have implanted in our hearts. May it always inspire us to be kind in our words, considerate of feeling, and concerned for each other's needs and wishes. Help us to be understanding and forgiving of human weaknesses and failings. Increase our faith and trust in you, and may your prudence guide our life and love. Bless our marriage, O God, with peace and happiness, and make our love fruitful for your glory and our joy both here and for all eternity. Amen. Amen. And actually, this prayer doesn't only apply to marriages, it applies to Every, every human uh, that God wants us to uh, have his love implanted in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Well, we are now at the end of our journey for today. Thank you for joining us on this journey to Cana of Galilee. Fellow pilgrims, on behalf of Pilgrim Center of Hope, I want to thank you for joining us for this journey. Because we are a pilgrim people, <clears throat> strive to live your journey of hope with boldness, passion, and joy. Until next time, may God bless you. Safe travels. Journeys of Hope, a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit our website at pilgrimcenterofhope.org.